present to you a project I've been working on, Expressions. So a little bit of history on this project. Uh, back about a year ago, I was working at a company called White Pages, and we, um, I got the opportunity to work on the redesign of this framework we call the Plan Execution Framework. Basically, we received a request, and then we needed to send a whole bunch of requests to like backend services in order to uh, build a response for the user. And obviously, we do this sort of asynchronously. Um, and this old framework, uh, it had a bunch of uh, problems with it. So it wasn't really maintainable. So um, I sort of jumped in um, to redesign it. The, the problem is it, it was untyped. Um, the idea was to have uh, just like a declarative way of, of specifying how to resolve a request. You just like tell it what needs to happen and it sort of does it for you. But in practice, you, you'd give it like dependencies. So like, you know, in order for this activity to run, you need these activities. Basically, it was a little bit of a nightmare. Um, and so when I came in, I really pushed hard to figure out, you know, what is this framework doing for us? Why, why do we need this complicated thing um, to do asynchronous code? And so I pushed hard to say, um, you know, in Scala, we have this nice abstraction called futures. Um, they're, you know, easily composable. So let's try and, and use that. And I ended up being sort of right. Um, we did end up being able to get rid of that, that framework and just use futures. But there were a few things with futures um, that, didn't, that, that we weren't able to get that the framework was sort of giving to us. And by far the biggest thing is uh, futures that fail fast. And what do I mean by futures that fail fast? So if we look at the code here, we have three futures. The first one is sleeping for one second and then returning a valid value. The second one is sleeping for five seconds, returning a valid value. And the third one is sleeping for three seconds and then failing. And so um, a typical way to use futures is to use four comprehensions. Um, and so if we do this four comprehension and you run this on your computer, you'll notice that this actually does not fail after three seconds. It's going to fail after five seconds. And this was something that the framework we were using was doing for us, failing fast. And it was an absolute requirement that futures needed to fail fast. So I was sort of disappointed. I didn't, I didn't expect this out of you know, Scala at, at the time. Um, and so you know, basically spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out what, why it is that um, this is not failing fast. So um, by the way, an interesting thing is that uh, I'm going to I'm going to explain why fundamentally it's not possible to fail fast with four comprehensions. But using vanilla futures, even without four comprehensions, sort of directly writing maps or flat maps, um, it actually doesn't fail fast either. But there's no fundamental reason why it can't fail fast. It's just the current implementation doesn't, doesn't do it. And as an interesting note, uh, Twitter futures do, do fail fast when you're using map and join. So, but why is it that I'm saying fundamentally in a four comprehension, you, you cannot fail fast? So for those of you that are savvy Scala programmers, you know that a four comprehension actually desugars to calls to flat map and map. So this is actually the resulting expression from the previous four comprehension. And so, uh, OK, well, you said that four comprehensions couldn't fundamentally fail fast. Um, what do you mean by that? So if we have a look at the signature to flat map, we'll notice that flat map is, you know, you give a lambda to flat map, a lambda from A to future of B, and it's going to produce you a future of B. So if you're the person that's in charge of impl implementing flat map, you don't have access to future of B until future of A is completed and giving you the A. At that point, you can call into the user function and get future of B. So fundamentally, it's going to be impossible for you to inspect future of B to see if it failed already before A completes. Um, is that, is that clear? Any questions on that? OK. Um, and so if we look at another function, let's say zip. So zip takes a, it's a, well, it's defined on future A. It also takes a future B, produces a future of AB. In this case, we have access to future B, so it's possible for us to fail fast. So we could rewrite the, 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 the code we saw previously with zip, and now this behaves like we want, like we want it to behave. Um, well, actually, in, in vanilla Scala, it doesn't, but it could behave like we wanted it to behave. Um, so as a side note, um, some of you might be wondering, well, 
There's a pretty cool notation out there called async await that's based on uh, um, this language features from C Sharp that allow you to deal with futures. Um, does that fail fast? Does that give us the properties we're interested in? And it turns out it doesn't. And the explanation for that, I don't know. Um, async is a bit of a complicated beast, and as far as I'm concerned, a big black box. Um, but I've tested it out, and it, it definitely doesn't work. Um, so we had a, a fairly limited amount of time to solve this problem. We uh, did end up solving it. Um, it, it, didn't, it wasn't like the perfect solution. Well, basically, no, it, it, I mean, it worked. We, we had um, futures that were failing fast. Uh, I gave a talk at Pacific Northwest Scala on how we solved it, um, making heavy use of uh, Shapeless and Scala-Z. Um, but I wasn't satisfied with our solution. It was the best solution we could come up with in the time we had, but I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. And the reason for that is I, believe, I strongly believe that for comprehension is a nice syntax. It's like a higher level syntax that allows you to reason about asynchronous code almost as if it wasn't asynchronous. You sort of like extract it from the context and then you can deal with it as if it wasn't a future and then it's just magically as a future. Well, it's not magic, it's very formal, but you, you know, it's a higher level abstraction. So it was annoying to me that I couldn't use for comprehension to do this. I needed to like directly use sequence and flat maps and, and all that. So at that point, I started working on a project that I'm tentative, tentatively calling expressions. And I'm now calling it an alternative to four comprehensions. So what's a high level view of the features for expressions? Um, so the first thing is it uses the least powerful interface. And I'm going to go into more detail on that. But that basically means that we can fail fast using this notation. Second of all, it plays well with if and match statements. If you go on the Scala async uh, GitHub page, you'll see that's one of the, that's one of the strong arguments is um, for comprehensions to sort of start to break down when you, when you have a bunch of if and match statements. They weren't really like designed to interop interoperate with, with them. Um, the third point is that it's a unified notation. So um, like, like for comprehensions, async await only works with future. This notation that I'm doing, it works with Scala future, it works with um, Scala Z task, it works with option, it works with any, any monad basically. Um, and finally, it's customizable. So if you want it to fail fast, you can provide an instance of a type class to do that. If you don't want it to fail fast, um, you can provide an instance that doesn't fail fast. You can, you can sort of customize it the way you want. So let's just dive into a few examples to see what it looks like. Oh, wait a minute. So failing fast. Here we have the same sort of situation we had before. We have three futures. Um, I shortened the notation here. The first one's waiting for five seconds. The second one's failing after one second. And the third one's waiting for three seconds. And so we have our good old four comprehension as the first example. So this is going to wait five, this is gonna wait five seconds. Actually, it should have been fail there. there that's, a, that's a mistake. It's going to fail after five seconds. Because it needs to wait after the first one. And then only after the first one is completed is it going to know, oh, the second one failed. Um, uh, whereas opposed to expression at the bottom, not only is it uh, more succinct, um, although so it's conf it's configurable. You can either use like implicit extraction here or explicit. Like you can make it. Some people might be scared. Like oh, a is sort of implicitly becoming being extracted into like what what it what's what's inside the the context. Um, but you can use uh, explicit extraction. I just want to keep the code. But the, the important point is by using expression here, we're failing at one second. And it's possible to do that. Um, and sorry, sorry, this slide's a little bit loaded, um, but it's not too complicated. We can go, we can go through it. Um, so interacting with if, we have the same situation here again. Well, like a similar situation. Actually, in this case, none of them are failing. They're all just waiting you know, a second, five seconds, two seconds. And in the first case, we're using our for comprehension. Is that big enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what happens here is, let's say a is equal to something, then you know we're we're calling this polish function on b or bb, which is b. And if it's not equal to something, we're calling polish on c. And so what happens here is, if we're using a for comprehension, we need to wait after a, b, and c. That's just how it works. Um, but to me, um, and I think to most people that are doing just you know run of the mill asynchronous code. If A you know, completes before the two other ones, and it ends up being you know, either equal to something or not equal to something, at that point, we can sort of just ignore B or ignore C, right? 
We don't really care about the result anymore. We're not going to use it. Um, and so unfortunately, if we're using vanilla four comprehensions, in both cases here, we need to wait five seconds. That's just how it works. So in the second case, we're still using vanilla four comprehensions. But what we're doing is that we're actually nesting the four comprehensions. And this is going to give us the behavior we want. And at the end, we need to flat map identity, which would be equivalent to flatten, but I don't think they're defined on future. Um, which is just to say, we end up with a future of a future of something because we nested them, and we need to like, flatten that into a single future. But we can get rid of all this notation and still get the property we want by using expression here at the bottom, which is just going to sort of auto-magically do the right thing. I say auto-magic because it looks auto-magic, and you can use it like it's auto-magic, but it's actually quite formal what it does. Um, and it's like easy to, to like reason about why, why it behaves the way it does. Uh, any questions up until now? OK. Um, and then another example is you know, using another abstraction. So here I have you know, a whole bunch of abstractions, option, error, writer, task, IO, list. And so list is an interesting one um, because list is not typically considered like a monad. So you know, it's, it would be a little bit weird to use um, list here as if it was a monad. Um, however, you can use this notation as well for applicatives. So list can be considered an applicative um, and the, the intuition for that is that like, it's like an undeterministic computation. So basically, um, if you have like three values and you're doing plus another list with three values, you end up with like um, all the, well, depending on, on how you instantiate your, your type class, either like the combination of all the pluses, of all the combinations, or just like the zip list um, instantiation. Um, but it can be useful if you're working with um, um, like errors or stuff like that to just like write a computation as if it was like one value, but it's actually like lists of value, and you end up with like a list at the end, which is the computation over the whole list. Um, and but in it, the important point here is that no matter what the abstraction, you can use this notation to sort of like peel off the the the, the context, you know, deal with the things inside as if they were just the things, and then you get the you, you get it in the context at the end. So how does it work? So it's based on Scala Z. Um, so Scala Z defines a hierarchy of uh, type classes. So there's functor, there's apply, applicative, monad, um, which are essentially based on you know the type classes you'd find in Haskell. So functor you know has a map. Um, we don't really use functor all that all that much. Um, apply is what we're really what's really interesting here. Um, so if you notice the signature apply to is actually um, very similar to zip. It's basically um, zip. And apply to is going to en enable us to fail fast. Um, and then you can derive map from apply to. Um, applicative in this, in this, in Scala Z is just extending apply and adding point. Um, whereas in Haskell, applicative is actually both point, because like there's no apply in the, anyway, not super important. And then monad extends applicative and provides bind. And bind is basically our flat map, which cannot fail fast. And you can derive apply to from bind. But if you do that, um, then you won't be able to fail fast. You're, using the you're losing flexibility in the implementation of your, of your function. And so what's really cool with this, uh, with this notation is that it's implemented in a pretty, pretty straightforward way. So here we have just like a basic code um, expression, and we're calling foo. And then we're extracting a and c, because a and c are futures. And we have this foo function that's defined over to strings. And what that actually just translate to, translates to is a call to applicative.apply to ac, and then we stick in the foo and you know, underscore, underscore. So in this case, actually, writing it out like manually actually seems to be simpler than using expression. Um, you start getting gains when the expressions are longer. Um, but what's really interesting is this, this is, there's no like, magic going on. It's just rewriting things into stuff that you could write manually. And so here I just want to talk a little bit about the importance of using the least powerful interface. Um, so in this case, we could have used uh, bind or flat map um, in order to implement this, because bind is a more powerful function than, than, than apply. It's, you, can you can express anything with bind. Um, but like I said, bind, you can't fail fast. So the, the, it's a, it's a trade-off here. If, you, if you're using bind, there's more things you can express as a user. But as the impl implementer of bind, you have less flexibility. When you're using apply, there's less things you can express 
um, on the user side to use apply, but as an implementer of the apply function, you have more flexibility. Um, and that's just like, that's a trade-off. So the idea of this notation is to use the least powerful interface that's necessary to translate the sugared code into desugared code, allowing maximum flexibility for people implementing the instances of your type classes to provide the, the, function, the, the, the glue code, the functionality um, that, that they want to provide. Um, so here's another example. In this one, monad is required because we have this foo function operating over strings. We have a bar function that operates over a string and returns a future of string. So we end up having to extract a to pass it to bar, and then we need to extract again the result of bar and foo. And so there's, there's no way you can do this with, with apply. So in this case, the, the notation is smart enough to detect, if you will, that it needs to use monad, and it's going to use bind to, in order to implement this. And then here's an example with the if statement, just to show how simple the transformation is. So we, we have if extract A, extract B, else extract C. You know, this is like super simple. And it just translates to bind over A, and then you know, if, if, if A is equal to something, then produce B, else C. Um, there's also the case of a match statement, sort of very similar to the if statement. Um, the translation is pretty straightforward. Um, it does get sort of interesting uh, when match statements get a little bit more complicated. Here's an interesting case. So expression supports blocks. So here we have a block, and then we're extracting foo, which is a future, putting, assigning it to foo y. So now we can sort of imagine that foo y is, is an actual string. And then we're extracting bar, matching over that. And then I don't know how many of you are familiar with this notation. I actually think I... I learned it like not that long ago, um, stable identifiers in uh, pattern matches. So this foo y, instead of binding uh, bar to foo y, we're actually checking if bar is equal to foo y. And you do that by putting backticks. Um, because by default, if you just put an identifier there, it's going to bind to that value. It's not going to compare based on the value in scope, even, even if foo y is, is defined up above. Anyway, so in this case, we want to check that they're the same. If they're the same, we extract the, you know, else extract C in here, you know, we're assuming that it's either going to be foo y or 2. Um, and the translation there is a little bit small, and you probably can't read it all that much, but it's basically because you know, it starts to get a little bit more hairy when you, when you need to do these things. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm a little short on time, so I won't go too much in details. So feel free to ask questions later. And it can get really hairy in this case, where you, you have like two of them. And here's where you start seeing the advantage of expression. Like clearly. It's easy, well, I believe it's easier to reason about the above code than the equivalent sort of manual code that you, you'd have to write yourself in order to, to get the desired behavior. And as a side note, match statements are definitely, as, as the implementer of this, ma of this expression macro, match statements are like the hardest thing to reason about. Um, they're definitely where like all the complicated cases are. So there are some similar projects out there, which is sort of comforting because I'm not going down this rabbit hole, um, hopefully. Um, so Effectful is a really interesting one. Its stated goal is to generalize uh, Scala async await. So in a way, it's very similar to, the, to my project. Um, unfortunately, it does not use the least powerful interface. So basically, like four comprehensions, it's always going to use bind or flat map. Because um, you, know, you, can't, you can't do that, but you can't fail fast. And that was like my main motivation at, at the beginning. Um, possibly, if, I'd, if I knew about Effectful when I started working on my project, I would have just figured out if there was a way to do this in Effectful. But when I discovered Effectful, I was pretty far along, so I decided I had more facility working on my own code base. Scala Workflow is a really interesting one. It's been there for a while. It's unmaintained now. Um, it's super featureful. It, has, it does all of this and, and a bunch more nested, nested uh, abstractions. Um, like manipulating the context from within the notation, all this really cool stuff. But it's based on untyped macros, which are now sort of deprecated in Scala. Um, and so it re-implements, because it's based on untyped macros and it receives an untyped AST, it actually has to do like a ton more work. Um, and I'm not, I'm not convinced that all that extra work is necessary. And because it has to do so much work to like provide the same functionality, it actually supports a very limited subset of Scala because it's so complicated. Um, 
I was actually having a conversation with Eugene the other day, and he basically, he, he knows the, the guy behind the project, and he was saying that uh, he ended up have to, having to like, almost re-implement scoping in Scala within his macro, which is you know, a little bit crazy. Um, and then there's async await. Async await um, seems to be, you know, a lot of people know about it. It's uh, you know, based on C Sharp. Uh, so like C Sharp has this cool thing, but it's sort of baked into language, which is unfortunate. Um, so async await tries to provide that in Scala with, uh, with macros. Um, and there's actually a SIP to like, include it in the standard library or something. I'm actually a little bit scared of that because I looked at the implementation and I don't know. It's just for, it only works with Scala futures. It doesn't work with Scala Z futures. It doesn't work with Twitter futures. Um, it doesn't work with any of the other abstractions. It doesn't fail fast. Like I don't really see what it's going, what ha what it has going for it really. Um, one could argue that because it's specialized for this one implementation of futures, it could exhibit um, superior runtime performance in, theoretically. Um, but I don't know if that's actually the case. So in terms of uh, my own projects, what are some of the known limitations and what are things that are known to work? So I have a pretty extensive uh, test suit. This is like a really fun project to test, actually. You can write specs that are super, I mean, uh, uh, pro Scala check properties that are really generic. Um, so function application is known to work pretty well, if else statements. Function currying, surprisingly enough, I actually spent time on that. String interpolation blocks and basic match statements. And where I, I know very well that this starts to break down currently is in uh, sort of, well, pattern matching and value definitions, because that's actually sugar, and then the Scala compiler is going to transform into a match statement. And complicated match statements tend to like, not work all the time, um, because, because I just haven't had the time, and also because like, Scala macros in their current form are a little bit hard to reason about, um, and sometimes just like, really hard to work with. Um, so when should you use uh, expressions? By the way, any, any questions? OK. Um, so just to, yeah? Uh, would it be possible to, when, when you fail fast, to like attempt to cancel the future? So that's like a separate problem. It's a really interesting problem. Um, so Twitter futures, like, you can like cancel them. The problem is like stopping a thread on the GVM is like deprecated. Um, it used to exist, and it was they weren't able to get it right, so they deprecated it. So, like the idea of like stopping a thread is not really like possible. Although, like maybe I think recently in Java 8 they might have started revisiting that. So, what like Twitter features are going to do is whenever you flat map, they're going to insert like their logic within the flat map to say like, oh, okay, we flat mapped, and this boolean flag was changed to true, so let's not execute the continuation. But like if you're sticking like a database access or some long computation within a future, and you're never like flat mapping over that, like there's, there's just no way you're going to be able to cancel it. And that's like a GVM limitation. Um, so I mean, unfortunately, this doesn't address that any more than. It, it would be some possibility, but you need a more powerful interface, because you need to have an interface to cancel. Because like, you can take up. The problem is, that, like in the GVM right now, unless you're going to like just put a whole bunch of Boolean checks within the, ex with, within the, the, the thread that's executing that stuff, Zero, you can't like kill it from the outside. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, some other thing. This is just a GVM limitation. Yeah, some other thing, of course. If, if, if the runtime allows you to, to cancel a thread, then you could totally expose that through like a future-esque API for sure. Yeah. Um, OK, so just I, I'm running out of time, but give an intuition on why you, when you'd want to use this project. Um, so if you're writing, and this is like a, a really strong use case, just a whole bunch of asynchronous code, and you just have a whole bunch of futures, and you just want to compose them together in a sensible way, and not have to like be boggled down with the details of how you you combine these things, then it, it's great. Like here in this case, you know, we're we're calling these services lookup phone, lookup address, lookup reputation. We don't even need to think about the dependencies. In this case, lookup address depends on phone, so we need the result of phone, obviously. But lookup reputation doesn't depend on address; it also rep, uh, depends on phone. So by using expression, it's sort of like you can think of it as like it's going to analyze your dependencies and use the right things, and just going to going to work in the like most like, sensible way you'd, you'd want it to work. And another interesting use case is when you have like, a large bunch of code. Like here's using Raptor JSON. Um, and any time you sort of like, grab a JSON value using Raptor JSON, it's returned as an option because it might not exist. Um, so you have like, all these options here, like, like so many options. And you just like, wrap the whole thing in expressions. And you've got a match statement and if statements. And it just, it just looks like normal code. And then in the end, just returns you an option of, of the thing. 
Um, just quickly, I want to mention it's not a replacement for four comprehensions. And I have a really good example here. So I work on remotely um, at Verizon. You should check it out. It's a really cool RPC system in, in Scala. And in our code base, we have this function time, which takes a task, which is like the equivalent Scala Z of future. And it returns a task um, that has the, the same A, but now has a duration on how much time it actually took to, to, to execute the task. And in this case, our implementation, we use four comprehensions. So we're calling task.delay, putting the current time, assign that T1. And then task is assigning to A, um, and then the current milliseconds. And because we're using four comprehensions, and four comprehensions use flat map, we can be assured that we're going to check the time, then we're going to execute task, and then when we're done, we're going to check the time again. And T2 minus T1 is actually going to be the real time. But let's say you were to use expressions here. Expressions, even though it's a formalized thing, you can think of it as it's going to be like, oh, man, you're not even using A in order to call task.delay. So I can parallelize that. I can call task.delay right away. And then you're not going to get the, the, the desired uh, result. So the way I think of it is like four comprehensions is like more a low-level thing. If you actually need to sequence your things in a very precise way, then you'd use four comprehensions. But if you just want to stick together things in like the normal way, then expressions is like a higher level um, abstraction. Um, there's future work is like to use Scala Meta. There's a whole bunch of things. Feel free to, if you're interested, come and see me. Uh, I think I'm going over time here. Um,